So in today's video, I want to cover some best practices on using user and admin accounts on your QNAP, as well as cover a little bit about groups to help you gain more security and flexibility. If you want to learn more about this, then watch the rest of this video. And please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notifications icon so you'll know when there's new content. If you're running a recent version of QTS, you're probably getting a warning when you log in that you're using the default administrator account and that you should disable this account. Unfortunately, it's not quite that easy. They don't really provide you with a good set of instructions on how to do this. So before you do this, it's kind of important to understand the process and how to do it right. So I'm going to walk you through how to do this and mention some areas that caused me some issues the first time I did it. Once you log in with the standard default account, you're going to see this message here that says you're using the default administrator account. And if you click on it, you're taken to the create user screen. There's not a lot to fill out here, but let's go ahead and fill this out so we can kind of get an idea of what how this works. I'm going to create this new user called new admin. I'm going to put a description up here, which is kind of optional, but it helps me identify the administrators on the list. You'll see that a little bit later on. And we're going to give it a password. You can optionally put an email and phone number in. And putting it in here just allows you to pick the user and, and have a, an associated email with it. So I recommend you put it in. It's just not required. So once I filled out my description, password, and username, I need to click on the user group and click on edit. Now, by default, it assigns everybody to the everyone group. However, that's not going to create an admin account. You need to make sure that you've selected the admin user group. So let's go ahead and do that. And once I'm done, it's all I have to do is hit create. So now if we look at the screen, you'll see that we've created the new user. We now have two administrators. However, I can't just go over here now and do anything. It's not going to let me do much with the old admin account. So if I tried to disable it now, it's not going to let me do it. So once you create your new admin account, you actually have to log off the old default admin account. So let's do that. Now, what I would suggest at this point is you can just log off and log back in. I might recommend that you reboot at this time if you can swing that without disrupting too much data flow. And the reason is I did have it hang up on me once and I did have to, to do with the three second back button reset to reset the credentials. Probably a good idea to reboot at this time if you can, but it's just not mandatory. For this purpose of this video, I'm just going to go ahead and log out. So let's log in with the new admin account. And when we log in, it's going to prompt us with a few things. Your data and privacy. It's going to tell us about the help center, which we don't want to see right now. we got to close all this up. Licenses available. We're going to close that up. And so we're now into the screen our new admin screen. You can see here that we're logged in with the new admin. Now that we've created and successfully logged in with the new admin, we have to do something with the default admin. And that's where this is now the part where we can actually go in and disable it. So let's go back to users. And if we go here to the standard default admin and we click on edit profile, we now have the option of disabling this account. That's something we couldn't do before. So let's go ahead and disable it. Click OK, and it's now disabled. So now every time we want to go in as an admin, we have to go in with our new admin account, whatever that is that you created. And again, I would make sure a couple times that you can successfully log in and out because it's going to be critical going forward. So now that we're, in, we're still in the control panel, I want to talk about user groups a little bit. If we click on user groups, as we saw earlier, there's only really two groups, the administrators and then everybody else. However, depending on how many people are using your NAS, you might want to consider creating one or two additional groups. And the reason is, if you look at, let's go ahead and create one. And I'm just going to call it test for now. Give it a description. What it does is it allows me to do a couple things. From this point, I can, if I've got current users um, already created, I can actually assign them to it. So let me go ahead and just put uh, user one and user two, and I can assign them to that group. So once the users are assigned, assigning permissions becomes pretty easy. The benefit of the groups is that everybody that's in that group can inherit the same permissions. So for example, if I take this group here, test, and I change the, the permissions, these are the folders I created earlier. I can change and rearrange this permission for this group as much as I want to. So for example, folder one, I can create read write. 
folder 2, read write, and folder 3, read write. And when I apply, it applies that to the entire group. So if I look again at who's, who I put in the group, I've got test user 1, test user 2. So if I go to shared folders and I go look at these groups, I can see that the test group has been given read write access. And if I go to folder 3, I can see the same thing. So if I go to podcast, for example, you can see that the test group's not been assigned. But what I can do here is click on it, switch to local groups, and go ahead and assign read write to that particular group, apply it. And now everybody in that group has read write access to podcast. So let's take a quick look and verify that that's true. So let's go to users. I'll pick a random one here. And we go to podcast, you can see that they have read and write. So it makes it really powerful. And again, you're not probably going to have a whole bunch of groups at home. But if you can have at least probably a couple, it does make your life easier. It does make it more manageable instead of individually having to assign permissions. So let's quickly talk about disabling or deleting users. So if I go in here and I'll pick on test user one, and I edit that person's account profile, and I click on disable, it's going to disable the account. It's going to prevent that user from, from logging in and out. However, it's not going to delete any data. So if we take a quick look at the file station, their user data, you, you can see that test user one still has all the data in there. They just can't get to it. So I can re-enable this account anytime I want. So let's go ahead and do that. And you can see it's now usable again. And the data hasn't been affected whatsoever. However, if I want to delete that user, I got a couple different other options. So let's go ahead and delete user one. And I'm going to do that by selecting the user here, clicking delete. Now, the first thing that comes up is, are you sure you want to delete select, selected items? But it also gives me an option to delete the selected user's home folders. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Say yes. So the user's gone. Now let's go over it back to the file station. And you can see that the under the homes folder, that user one is gone. So that all of that data that was in there is now gone. So you got to make sure you know what you're deleting. It's okay to delete a, delete a user, but you just have to understand when you're deleting the data. Now, no other data is impacted. So you can go to any folders and they'll still be there. So if I go look at podcasts, no, there's no data in there right now, but the folders are there, everything's intact. So before we end this video, I want to talk briefly about the difference between home and homes directory and whether or not you even want to use them. They can be confusing to interpret if you haven't used a NAS all that long, but I'm going to try to explain it because they actually it's a pretty powerful tool and you can decide for yourself whether or not you want to use it. You click up here on the home folder in the user screen or all the users have enabled home folder. So that's on by default. So if you set up a NASA or you haven't actually went through the trouble of turning it off, that's going to be enabled, which means every new user, the first time they log in, it will create a home folder for them. So if we look quickly at the file manager again, and I look here under homes, we can see our users. I've only logged in with test user two, the new admin, and of course we just deleted test user one. So these folders are created when you log in. So the primary difference between, because if you logged in as an administrator and you look at your file manager, and let's do that real quick. So I'm gonna log in with the administrator on that folder. And if I log there, you're gonna see two folders, home and homes. Now only the administrator can see the homes. So if I see here, I'm gonna see the actual data for all the users. But as a standard user, or if, I've, if I access the folder as a user, the only thing I'm ever gonna see is home. And that's where my personal data is gonna go. So as a user, I'm only gonna see home and I'm gonna be able to put my data in and out of there at will. The average user is not gonna see the home, homes folder. But as an administrator, it's powerful to be able to go in there and extract the data in case the user gets their account messed up and or whatever, whatever reason, you need to go in there and quickly get stuff. You can get to it as a, as an administrator. So a couple other things you might want to keep in mind, and these this one's kind of important. If you look at the home folder, you'll see that 
there's a location here. Now, if you followed any of the protocols or best practices uh, from my previous videos, you know that I typically create different volumes on my NAS unit. And one of those volumes is typically a encrypted data. And the reason you want to think about this is because you have to understand that though the folders are password protected, you still are somewhat vulnerable if somebody was to take that NAS. So put, encrypting that data is, is kind of critical. But unfortunately, depending on how you have your NAS configured, your data is probably not in an encrypted folder. So if you look here, I've, been, I've created several volumes for my particular NAS, and one of those is an encrypted volume. So if I want to really protect my data so that if the, if the drive gets, or if the NAS gets stolen or anything like that, you want to put those folders in an encrypted volume. You don't have to, and, and I understand they're password protected, but it's really best practices to put that data in an encrypted folder. So let me show you how to do that real quick. It's very simple. Assuming you have created the encrypted volume. If you haven't, you might want to go back and consider doing that. But if I go to back to home folder, I can now switch that to any one of the volumes I've created. So in my case, I've already assigned it to the encrypted data folder. So when a user logs in, all of their home stuff is created in an encrypted volume and they don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. So the last thing I want to discuss is should you use the home folders? There's obviously a lot of pros and cons. Um, when I first started using NAS units, it the whole concept made me a little crazy, so I kind of didn't use it. I preferred to create my own folders and put the user's data in there, which you can do. You can create folders, you know, per user. You can assign permissions to it, and that's what they'll see when they log in. And a lot of times you can get a lot more creative in the naming scenarios, so it's a lot easier to, to manage. And you can also create different backup schedules and so on. So there are some advantages for not using it. However, I've kind of grown to go the other direction and I leave, I now leave the home folders on by default. It's a little more consistent throughout users and it's a lot less in terms of management. As long as you've moved the home folder into an encrypted volume, you can kind of get away with making it work. To me, it, it's now become easier because everything's centralized in one location and the entire volume is encrypted. So I hope this kind of gives you a better idea of how to create the different accounts, how to disable them, how to delete them, and just kind of a quick overview of the home folders and certainly where to position the home folders. So one last thing I wanted to mention about home folders is that if you decide to move the location to an encrypted volume, it does copy the data to the new location. It doesn't automatically delete or move them. So you'll have to go back in yourself and get rid of those folders and get rid of the duplicate data. Um, and that's probably a good thing because you start moving things around, things can get lost, confused, or corrupted, and you need trouble then. So in this particular case, you can go and change the location of the home folder to anything you want, and it's just going to create a snapshot of that. It's going to move all that data to the new location and leave the old data behind for you to clean up. So it's just something to know. Anyway, I hope this gives you a better idea of how to create admin accounts, user accounts, delete them, disable them, kind of a little bit better understanding of home folders, how to store them, where to locate them. And that's pretty much it for today's video. Please post any of the questions and comments below. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.